to our December Citizen Involvement Council meeting. I'm Amy Wilhite. I am the chair. I've been gone a couple months, so it feels great to be back. Hopefully, <laughs> I'm done with all of my crazy issues. If you would like to speak tonight and you're not on the agenda, but there's something that you would like to address, if it's on, we need you to fill out a comment card, which you can find in the back and give it to Laura. That's for items that are on the agenda or items that are not on the agenda. Either way, that way we have a record of who is speaking. A couple things for our members, a little housekeeping. I would like to remind you that these microphones only work when they're on, but when they are on, they work very well. So if you're speaking, please make sure your microphone is on. And if you're leaning over to talk to your neighbors, please make sure your microphone is off. I got a lot, I was very, after I watched all of these meetings, I know a lot of little side things that probably you don't realize I heard. So you might want to remember that when the microphone's on, Tony and Brian, we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Just trying to kill two birds with one stone, I know. Um, also, I'd like to remind, the, we have, the dais has the monitors and these wonderful microphones. So when you come to the meetings, if you could fill this first, before the little side tables where we have to use the portable mics because um, that way it's a lot easier. We don't have to pass the microphones. And if you're in the audience and you're trying to comment or ask a question of, of us up here, when, you're, when we're in the room, we can hear you pretty well, but the microphones don't pick up anything out of the audience. So there was a, several times where somebody had asked a question and I didn't know what the question was. So, and I'm not the only one I hope that watches those on. I know Barbara a lot of times likes to watch it to pick up what she missed on her minutes. So those are the little housekeeping things and I will turn it over to Barbara for the roll call. Okay, um, Tony, who's Tony Yu? Tony Yu. Um, Mark is excused and Linda Basinger is excused. Dennis Anderson. Here. Mike Mitchell. Here. Amy. Here. Faith is excused. Joyce. Here. Jesse. Here. Gordon. Barbara. Stephen Haverbeck. Here. Karen is excused. Harris. Uh, Bill McConnell is excused. Gary Fergus. Here. And Brian Boyce. Okay, thank you, Barbara. So first up, we have the Girl Scouts coming back to debrief us on their workshop at, I don't know how to say that, Lotteret? Lotteret. Okay, at the ladder park. <laughs> oh, the old swimming pool then. All right, so come on up to the front and fill us in. Red dot means on. Hi, my name is Karen Burig, and I live in the McLaughlin neighborhood. Um, I've lived there about 20 years, and I am um, a mother of a 12-year-old, Kate, and a Girl Scout leader. And and I'm Heidi, and I live in the McLaughlin neighborhood as well. I've lived here eight years, and uh, of course, Karen and I bond over our 12-year-old daughters. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a co-leader with Karen. So tonight we just wanted to, we were here last month to share information with you about uh, an event that was going to be happening, the DC Lateret Park Planning Workshop. And we wanted to give you an opportunity, I know there were a few people that had attended, um, to really learn a little bit about what happened at the workshop, but mostly talk about um, community-led engagement and ways that perhaps the CIC could support that as we move into the future because we're only um, kind of at the beginning stages of this project. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can figure this out. All right. Oops. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, yeah. Is that the first slide? Yep. Okay. Sorry. Um, so our goal really is to create a, a gathering place for all. And this is a quick little picture of a Lateret Park, if you haven't visited it. Those are probably the um, 
some of the, the funnest things to do at Ladderette Park is play in the puddles. Um, and there are basketball courts in the back. Um, but this is an area that definitely, uh, I think all would agree upon would need uh, some investment. Um, so the Girl Scouts and this troop have been involved in this project for the past year. And in March, uh, they did a project on their own to uh, raise awareness about the need um, to invest and to see change in uh, Ladderette Park. Um, and I won't go into that in a whole lot of detail because we probably talked about that last time. But they got the word out through their cookie sales and a newspaper article and 70 people came to their, um, their event. And so this, what weekend were we? We were November 11th, 12th, yep, 11th, 13th. 12th. Um, we, uh, the troop had received a grant uh, to be able to hold a workshop for park planning. And it was a full three day workshop, Friday night, full day Saturday, full day Sunday. Um, but at the end of the workshop, we came out with a vision. Uh, for that workshop and it's really exciting. It's still being um, kind of finalized by the consulting team uh, and we'll be coming back probably in the January <laughs> January or into the next year with to talk about the details of the park but one of the really exciting things that came out of it was really about building community. Hmm. Um, on a Friday night and there were a couple of people I, Joyce, I don't know if, were you there Friday night? Um, there were a couple of people that uh, had been here uh, that attended on Friday night. And the focus of the conversation really was about building community and working together um, to really not just get to know your neighbors, but, but um, what would you say, kind of sort of build investment um, and ownership of public spaces and the importance of that in, in community today and in our society today. And it really was truly applicable in, uh, for our project in particular. So tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about why uh, Ladderette Park and really what kind of caused us to think about this in the first place. Um, talk about some community-led activities that our other people were talking about and perhaps maybe engage in a little conversation about what the uh, CIC can do to support um, the work we're doing out there. Um, so why Ladderette Park? When we were interviewed for the newspaper article, uh, Raymond had said, oh, tell us the story. Tell us the story about how two kids met at this park and they were so disappointed in the park. And, and, uh, and I was thinking to myself, well, you know, that's actually not the story of why we worked on this. So uh, Heidi really is uh, um, the impetus behind this park change. We did talk about this at a Girl Scout camp out um, and activities in our neighborhood. Um, and this really came about um, because of the desire for uh, to improve our neighborhood and the fact that there was a lot of neighborhood change going on. Um, Ladderette is located on 11th and Madison. Um, it's pretty close to 12th Street. Um, that had uh, a day school. Day shelter. Yeah, it has the day shelter for um, Father's Heart, but it also has um, Merrill Hurst. Merrill Hurst. Mm -hmm. Merrill Hurst had been there. Um, but there was really an interest in improving neighborhood safety. And uh, because there's just was a lot of change, they took the, the play facilities out and there were less of the Merrill Hurst uh, families and seemingly more of the folks visiting um, Father's Heart. And how do you deal with that? And well, getting the community out in the neighborhood and eyes on the street and mm -hmm. getting to know your neighbors yeah. and doing all of that. I was really interested in doing. Uh, and so Heidi said, I want to have a block party. Yeah. <laughs> want to have a block party. And she called the city and they said, well, you have to pay $150 to, because we're going to huge metal, yes. um, close the streets and do all of that. And I think Heidi was really disappointed. Well, I, I just, <laughs> I, I didn't have the $150 to host a party to, to help collaborate and bring my neighbors together. And so I wrote a letter to the city and asked them if they could waive the fee if I invited everybody on the street because the, the, the point of the party would be to come out and collaborate as a neighborhood so that we could discuss how we can deal with what's happening in our neighborhood. And I had um, over 80 people sign 
a petition and um, I was denied a, a block party permit. permit. And so I, I complained to the right person, which was Karen, at a camp, Girl Scout campfire. <laughs> <laughs> and I was t speaking of my dis frustrations, and then she said, this is, this is a cool idea. Let's, let's move forward with this. Yeah. We can do something with that. And so in, just so you guys know, I mean, other people know, but I have another hat. And I, do work, I worked in county government for quite some time as a transportation planner. So I just, I, I said, well, there's got to be the way to work this out. And let's talk to some folks. Let's talk to the um, parks uh, director. And, and we talked to people. And everybody knew that something needed to be done about Ladder at Park. Um, and uh, people appreciated our goal to create a place where people wanted to be. Um, but they just didn't know how. And they knew that they didn't have money to do it. Um, but we really wanted to focus on Ladderette Park because it, it's a neighborhood asset. And the, obviously, there were people there that wanted to do something. Um, and so this was something that the city repair team spoke to directly um, on Friday night about how people really do want to be engaged in their communities. But sometimes they, they reach those roadblocks, and, and then they get frustrated. And, then they close their doors and they don't talk to their neighbors. And I, I, I think it's really important in the McLaughlin neighborhood, especially and, and especially around um, Ladderette Park, because it is there are so many different people out on the streets and you wanna you wanna be there with your neighbors and know who your neighbors are and, and make it a better place. So so uh, City Repair had talked a lot about interacting with public spaces and really the fact that our streets and our parks are our public spaces and how can we make them places that people want to be. Uh, and, and that's what we're interested in. So there were some people there that really were, and I know uh, other places in the McLaughlin neighborhood are interested in really focusing on intersection design. And this is kind of a picture, a drawing of, of um, of people who have been able to paint an intersection and it causes traffic to slow down and people want to be there and they do different things on the corners and and these neighborhoods they're really um, they're required to uh, to take ownership and maintain these things um, but it really brings people together mm -hmm. um, so that's some things that happen um, and and so during our workshop we had an exercise where we talked about that intersection design uh, we also then talked about designing, our, our project is a little bigger because we're looking at a whole park, um, uh, but it had the this, this same sort of um, things that we applied to it. Um, but then there was also the discussion of the benefits of community, um, community led projects. And what we're doing is community led public engagement. And uh, one of the things I want, I was hoping you guys would think about, because it comes, I think about it. Is, is understanding that you know, it's, it's different than just a city doing the project and they'll do a public engagement process and then they move to the next step and whatnot. Um, but we've done a public engagement process, but now we want to be able to know that other people value that, that that was a worthwhile event, right? And then we can go to the next step. And so there are all these different processes that are slightly, um, slightly different. So how the CIC can can kind of uh, provide guidance on, on public engagement even. And oh yeah, you guys, that was, that was enough or that was not enough or we need more, that type of a thing. So um, a couple of things that I just thought maybe would uh, kind of start off some conversation could be um, talking about what, what are ways that we can support the neighbors that want to strengthen their community. So, you know, and using the example that we ran into, okay, so there's, People might want to be using some public space and have a lot of support. Maybe there's a way that we can talk about, you know, uh, options for street closure fees. Maybe there's a small little bucket, or I don't know enough <clears throat> about neighborhood associations. You guys know that a lot better. Uh, maybe there's a tiny bit that that can be used for these these events that benefit more than just a couple people. Um, so the answer isn't just no right away. Um, and then the other thing that I thought would be good to talk about is, uh, you know, not just tonight, but in, in to the future. What are some guidelines for community-led engagement? What are the things that, that are important to value that you know that, that really people have been reached out? We, we did a lot of work 
getting the word out about our project and uh, doing all the social media and flyers. There was a lot of... We went door to door. Door to door. We got um, it in the paper. It was on the McLaughlin neighborhood postcard. Right, yeah. exactly. And we had 50 people uh, attend the event and we came out with a vision, um, but now trying to figure out where that will go next. So um, <clears throat> I think that those are, uh, yeah. So. So really, we're um, excited about where we're at. Um, this project, we came out of that project. Uh, 50 people participated. We already had our first team, core meeting team. There's at least eight or 10 people that are going to meet monthly to make the next steps. We want to do what we can to activate and use the park. We're talking about doing a Let's Be Merry event here in <coughs> December, a neighborhood gathering. Um, that people can just see, hey, that place is being used, and oh, I know you, tell me more about what's going on. Um, and so there's gonna be more coming up in the new year. We've, we've been contacted by Ray from the newspaper who also does a community news um, show, and we're gonna be on that, and, um, and we're gonna try to figure out what the next steps are for the project. So anyway, with that, that's kind of the closing of this presentation. We're here just to, um, let you guys have quite if you guys had questions or wanted to or also give us feedback on on processes forward and how you think that we could best approach going forward as far as community involvement engagement and what that looks like anyone anyone <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you been meeting with the McLaughlin neighborhood yeah. when you I remember and, being at one meeting and you guys were there. I think that must have been back in March or something. And, and Denise has committed to be a part of our core team for that project. Was the block party actually at the park that you wanted to have, or was it just in a different neighborhood? It was just a on a, neighborhood? a residential street on oh, okay. 11th between John Adams and um, A.Q. Adams. Um, Amy, if I may. Yeah. Um, so I attended um, four hours on... Saturday okay. and and again went back yeah. for Sunday afternoon um, was really impressed with um, the girls remaining focused on what the final vision was going to be that um, so to get that young energy going um, so I'm really excited to see what the what the consultants bring back for their final report and um, hope you guys keep on moving forward look for another grant to finish it mm -hmm. um, you know, or at least part of it, mm -hmm. you know, getting, um, you talked about the amphitheater space in the corner, that's a natural space that's not going to take a lot of money, but it's going to take some labor, and let us know when you're doing that, because we'll bring it to our neighborhoods and get back to you, and, you know, there may be a, quite a few people showing up that day, um, so that's what we're, how we could help you. Um, additionally, uh, Oregon City High School construction is involved and was was attended our event and so okay. did um, two representatives from case and a few students and case is just they keep emailing me every day they can't wait to get their hands involved in this project Good. so oh, okay. yeah that's wonderful sounds yeah. like you guys are on the right path have you did you, I don't remember did you use um, Oregon City chit chat that group on Facebook because they're almost at 9,000 members mm -hmm. and it's amazing the yeah. kind of responses that I've seen happening on there yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think that that was good and, and um, next door we did next door next yeah door. next door I saw that and we've, we've really I, I've been really impressed with the uh, support that we've gotten from Oregon City Parks Department in the sense of allowing us to be able to do this type of work um, and they actually uh, we sat down and met with Phil um, after the event and he was going to be looking into sort of some examples of of similar park investments that were guided by a community group up in different areas and how you handle that. Because I imagine money's going to be your biggest thing, right? I think I'm, money. You don't think but, that'll well, be a part of I would of say bureaucracy. <laughs> I, well, I do. I, 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 I can raise Interesting. money. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I, I, do, I do get concerned about just approval processes, yeah. you know, like, okay, okay you know, making sure that everything each step along the way kind of gets a, a check off, even though there's not a specific process for it. So it's part of the reason why we want exactly. to be able to be checking in as much as possible so we don't get too far off track because we can't really 
apply for a grant to do something until we know we've got approval to do something, right? But there's not really approval process. Um, but it, it really is exciting to have a vision on paper. Mm -hmm. And we know that that vision will evolve. Will evolve. Yes. Mm -hmm. Evolve is a very good word. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Shaw had something he wanted to say too. Oh, I, so I uh, <coughs> got to uh, attend for a few hours on Sunday of your workshop there. And uh, it's one of those things you walk in and you see this little sketch that they put together and stuff on the wall. You're sitting there. Man, I wish I would have been there on Friday and Saturdays and watched this thing just grow yeah. like this, yeah. like that. Yeah, it yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah. It was. You know, and you walk up there and look at that, and you look at these guys and the scouts and the girls and stuff, and says, how did you guys do that? You know, and, <laughs> but uh, then meeting with the uh, construction, uh, high school construction uh, uh, teacher, the uh -huh. new guy, the new guy they have, and, and then the, uh, the guys from Case and stuff, I figured, I think this is going to happen. So I really encourage you to stay in touch with all of these guys here because uh, this is kind of your family here mm -hmm. that's going to help you uh, through this because they have influence on the bureaucracy around here and stuff. So. Well, good. Okay. And we've got a guy sitting right next to him that we can use. To... I really you know, thought, like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll point us into Laura's counterpart that's over that. That's right. you got, you got, uh, you got a few of them right here sitting here, so yeah, this is so good. Feel Anytime free. you can get here. So. Yeah. Yeah. Come in and chat with us. Because we'll that is through. a very valid point of knowing beforehand because there's nothing more frustrating than spending hours and hours on something and being told that that was useless. You have to go in a different direction or something. So I'm sure meeting up front as much as they can with whoever it needs to be in that department will be mm. key. Go ahead. I, yeah. Um, I like that, um, The not the finished um, this one, one on this side, but the one with all the little paper um, pieces. bit pieces mm -hmm. on the um, overhead view. Um, we all we split up into groups and we all kind of like um did like we all we'd are all gone to the tennis courts beforehand and all kind of like talked about where we wanted things um and most of ours ended up being pretty much the same um in the fact that like we had all agreed on this one kind of like Vision. idea mm -hmm. um and so it was really easy for us to i mean there was a few arguments but um <laughs> uh we all kind of really it was really easy for us to kind of agree on what we wanted our vision to be for our park that's wonderful and i do think there are some um what's nice is that there are some features that you can kind of break off and perhaps focus on and be able to move some pieces forward before mm -hmm. other pieces mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. really i think our next challenge is really to identify the place to focus on the grants to apply for um and, and I do think we have this, the strong neighborhood. I was really impressed with, especially on the Saturday morning, all the neighbors that lived right there on 11th uh, that came up and, and were at that very important part of the goal setting and the, um, kind of working with uh, the designing of the intersections. So. And, and can I say that, you know, some people that, that stayed for the duration of the, the workshop are people I've never met who came and were very interested and showed a lot of dedication to the project. And then when we meet monthly, this is a soup night. So everybody comes together at one person's house and the one person that's hosting makes the soup and everyone else gets to have something to eat and chat and just kind of, like Karen was saying, this is great that a park might come out of this, but more, more importantly, this is a community engagement activity. This is something that more neighbors come together and they go hey you live down the street how did what happened there because the vision of the workshop was we need places where people come together because we don't have places where people run into each other mm -hmm. authentically mm -hmm. you know what i mean we set it up we invite you to a party but we want to create places where you run into your neighbors where you can create conversation and know what's happening in each other's lives the people that live close to you so I think that that was our, and then I, I wanted to say one other thing is that we kind of put you on the spot, but if there's anything else that you have to add as you, you know, ruminate on this concept of us wanting to know how best we can be supported going forward, or if you have any advice for us, send us an email. Um, we'd appreciate it, just kind of knowing how, 
what's the best process for us going forward. So how do we get a hold of you? Um, Karen, would, are you email, did you email Laura? Yeah, so Laura okay. has Okay, me. Laura has your email. Okay, Jesse? Thanks, Amy. My name's Jesse. I'm representing the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association. I would have been there for the event if I wasn't out of town, but I've been following it closely and I appreciate all of the work you guys have done. Um, just a quick suggestion, since you will be moving forward, needing more resources, trying to leverage resources that you do have, there's a local organization in Portland called the Awesome Foundation, and every other month they do micro-grants um, of $1,000, and it's easy to apply, there's no strings attached, and they don't require necessarily the same level of finalized plans that other grants might, so it's something to look at. Thank so you. That's all. Thank you. Question. Um, Go guys. ahead, Jim. So, Karen, I'm um, just curious, given um, the group and the interest right now, and uh, is there a timeline that there's some small components that could move this thing forward? And that's one question. And then one point is, if you do have another meeting and you invite Public Works, I uh, like Samoas, I think, or the... Okay. The, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Can I, uh, I'm with you. I'll come to that meeting. The uh, cookie season is going to be opening up start, starting January, so we'll be taking pre-orders. Okay. You know, they and well for too. them to arrive in February, so we might conveniently schedule okay. a meeting around there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, there, there will be, um, like we said, that hopefully there'll be pieces that we can really jump start but really trying to identify which piece that is. Mm -hmm. So uh, we hope to have the um, designs um, back from the consulting team sometime later this month. We were going to try to arrange kind of a city staff meeting this month, but I don't think that's probably going to come together. Because um, mostly we know that grants start to come available come April, and then the next round of the community enhancement grants are in the end of kind of May, June, and we want to really be able to take advantage of those, but then take advantage of good weather um, to, and then also working with the high school in case um, they are very eager and we don't want to lose that enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. So, Mike? Uh, you had a All I was going to say is um, please keep the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee up to speed. Mm -hmm. I, I think it might be time for you to come back to the to that group again because that that is part of the bureaucracy that yeah. you're going to have to deal with yeah. is coming past mm -hmm. there I, I i think this is whoops um now you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna stop there i was gonna sound grinchy for a second so i'm not gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes they will be your other partners <laughs> So okay. for yeah. the bureaucracy part of it, uh, you're, you're doing all the right steps. Keep in contact with Phil. Um, so after you build the park, make sure you know he can maintain the park and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then Phil can work with me, and we'll get you through that planning process. Um, but it's all a matter of going through the public approval process mm -hmm. for the bureaucracy. So it's not, it's not that bad. Um, just making sure that we can really maintain it and um, help support it for the long term. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kelly Reed from the planning department talking to us and about the Willamette Falls Legacy Project Riverwalk. Thank you, Amy. Laura is bringing up a presentation for me. Uh, thank you, uh, CIC, uh, for having me again. I think I was last here over the summer. Um, Amy and I were trying to figure out when was the last time this group got an update on Willamette Falls, um, and we couldn't recall. So if you do, remind me of what I've already said. But hopefully everything that I have will be new information for you. Um, I'm a planner uh, in Oregon City's Community Development Department, um, and uh, this, this presentation we're calling um, a community conversation. Uh, we're kind of going out to all sorts of different groups in the community uh, to get input and feedback on Riverwalk design. So we have, a, we have some design concepts out right now. Uh, and so we're kind of shopping those around to the whole community 
to get that input, which will lead to a preferred river walk design um, later um, this uh, early spring. So around March, uh, you'll see a preferred concept, and um, we really want uh, lots of input to go into that. Um, we've, you know, we've spoken with you multiple times before, and you know we've had lots of events. And so this is just one of those um, ways for you to engage and, and give your input into the project. Uh, so I'm going to be if I'm going to be showing you as quickly as I can um, some of the designs, and then hopefully we'll have time for a discussion, and I'll take notes, and then we take those notes and kind of document them, and then share them back with the design team so they can have the input from the CIC. Okay, so we're going to go through this very quickly at the beginning, because I know you all have the background information. Uh, the four core values, public access, healthy habitat, historic and cultural interpretation, and economic redevelopment. And then, of course, the framework plan, which we will show you every time uh, we talk about this project. Uh, as just a summary of our um, previous engagement, we had an open house in March. We went to the first city celebration, and then just recently, November 17th, we held another open house and workshop. Um, who was there? Great. Okay, and good that there are folks that won't that <coughs> weren't there. So this information will be new to you. And um, those who were, uh, you probably have thought about it before, and will have new thoughts tonight. Uh, so we are, are also engaging um, with our tribal partners. There are five tribes with historic and current ties to the falls. Um, the lamprey harvest, of course, happens um, every summer, and we are working um, simultaneously. With, uh, with our tribal partners through a tribal advisory board. Um, and we're looking at ways to, um, to include uh, uses and maybe um, places for tribes to, to, to have and enjoy on the site. In addition to that, uh, there are seven other key uses and a few other you know, options. Um, on the site. So really all the input that we got over the past six months starting in March has uh, led to you know the identification of these broad categories of uses that will occur on the Riverwalk. And it includes falls viewing, of course. We all know that. It's pretty obvious. Some of these are obvious, but you know they need to be stated. Uh, river access and activities, what type of river access that is, we don't know yet, but we'll talk about it. Uh, collective gathering and event space. Habitat restoration and natural history interpretation, honoring of Native American presence, uh, past, present, and future. PGE dam operations, of course. Uh, paths, walkways, and biking and hiking trails. Um, and then historic reuse and cultural interpretation. And all of this will support uh, economic redevelopment on the remainder of the property. And so uh, I, hopefully if you were at the event, you saw this um, graphic in larger form and more readable form. But really, this takes all of the input that we heard um, over at the First City Festival about seasonal activities. So this is a calendar, you know, January on the um, left-hand side to December. And the, um, you can see actually the flow, uh, water flow at the falls is one of those, that, that blue line. Uh, and then the others are representing kind of the uh, activities and um, times of year that we heard the people wanted uh, identified at the First City Festival. So you'll notice that one at the bottom is river access activities, and the bar is a lot higher during that summer season than the remainder of the seasons. Um, on top of this, we're layering uh, uh, fish species information and, and kind of what seasons we see different species. Uh, wildlife uh, on the site, birds, migra migration patterns, um, PGE dam operations, what time of year do they manipulate their dam and, and do certain things. Uh, and so all of that is you know, layered together into this calendar that um, is going to be uh, a living document that we're going to use moving forward. Another thing we're doing is the hydraulic modeling. Um, this represents a two-year flood event. So the velocity of the water is, uh, the color shows the velocity, or the depth, I'm sorry, of the water. And the darker colors, like purple, are deeper, of course. And then the arrows, um, the, the dark 
the thickness of the arrows uh, represents the velocity. So CH2M is, is doing this work, and the reason for it is, you know, we know the site floods, and we know that we might be removing uh, structures and, and elements out there. And so as we remove things or as we add things, we want to know what's going to happen, what, what the flood conditions um, will do and how they'll change. So we'll be able to test that using this model. So we'll, we'll be able to know if we remove a building or the clarifier or any of these structures, um, what does that mean for flooding and how does that change the currents and, and where the water flows in you know, your, your typical winter storm and even in the 100-year flood. Uh, habitat also is um, being looked at. We, uh, we've identified six different habitat types that exist or could exist on the site and then looked at where those um, are most ideal and how we can improve them. So that work is ongoing. Um, these are the six habitat types. Uh, we have lots more information that we'll be posting. Um, some of this is online. We'll be posting more online. So if you're really interested in getting into the weeds about habitat, you can. Uh, and then, of course, we're looking at different ways to access the site, connect it up to the rest of the city, to downtown, to the promenade, to Kanima. Uh, and then um, we're inventorying all of the uh, buildings and historic structures uh, to figure out, you know, on top of those five buildings that we've identified two years ago, uh, what else is, uh, what else we can keep, what kind of materials we can keep, how can we reuse some of these building materials if buildings or structures do come down. Okay, now the fun part, design alternatives. Uh, so our design team basically break, broke the site down into four areas, and they're kind of looking individually at each of those areas to make it kind of easier to to um, to deal with, and then of course we'll look at it holistically uh, as well. Um, sorry. Uh, so we have a base river walk plan, and and you'll notice that a lot of this is grayed out. Um, this river walk plan is kind of what we shared with the public at the event on November seventeenth, and. Um, what it basically is saying is that we have a lot of work to do still on other areas of the site. So there, um, we're still doing some research, working with the property owner, working with PGE to figure out um, what the options are for those other areas. But we had enough information about the uh, North River Bank, the Clarifier, and the Pipe Chase, and the Holly Powerhouse, and certain elements that we were able to go to the public and, and really ask for um, input on those. And so. We chose six uh, key elements to really focus on at this public event, and I'll show you those designs right now. Uh, the but but first, I always forget about this bright orange slide. Um, we want to just emphasize that the river walk is more than a walk. Uh, so we when we think about kind of the river and Main Street and the river walk being that space in between, um, it's not just a line but it weaves between buildings back into development and is, is fully integrated with um, development and, and activities. And in addition to that, um, we're not just looking at you know, one kind of elevation. Uh, this site has many layers, and when you look start at the river's edge, um, you can really go, go a lot high for, higher from there to the top of a building. So, we're looking at the three um, at at the Riverwalk in 3D. Um, really, how can we take advantage of those layers? So the first area is the um, area one we're calling North Riverfront, and there were two questions that we're asking about this one. One is about what type of water access, and then the other is um, the Explorer trails. You know, we're kind of just showing white curvy lines on there, but what are they really? What do they look like? What's the experience? So this is, um, um, I think all of you have been on, a, on site before. Uh, this is um, that North Riverfront area. You have some industrial um, artifacts and elements like that concrete bulkhead, uh, which is included in, in a lot of these design concepts. The first one, the first one um, looks at uh, water access um, 
through. Oh, this is our base drawing. I'm sorry. So here's a just a 3D section, uh, 3D rendering, um, and you can see up in the corner where that uh, that site cutout is. It's kind of right there where that bulkhead exists. And so um, this is our kind of base map, and then we've got three different options that we're looking at. So one is uh, no river access, no way to get down to the water, just habitat restoration, but uh, explorer trails with maybe access to that bulkhead as a viewing, um, viewing deck um, or fishing platform potentially. The second option is uh, a gathering area down on the shore and a kayak launch. And then the third is actually a um, dock that would allow for motorized boats to dock there. So private motorized watercraft could, could land at the site and then you know people can kind of go up and go to a restaurant or go see the falls. So uh, these are the three options that we looked at and we had these available at the event. Uh, we got a lot of comments on these. And, um, and we also have a survey uh, online that you can take. I hope, I'm sure some of you have taken it already. Um, you can weigh in that way. And then uh, next week, we're going to see a report from our consultant team of the results of the event and the survey. So we'll be able to share that with you. Um, but I think there was a lot of support for all of the options. Um, you know, as, as far as we know, like there's not one that's really, really standing out, but everybody likes different aspects of all the options that we're showing. Uh, and so for the Explorer Trails, uh, we don't have design options, but we have precedent photos. And so we want, um, we asked people to pick out which ones they really liked the most and thought would be um, kind of an appropriate style, material, or, or experience uh, on the river walk. And for this one, I, I can tell you that the least less popular ones were like kind of these dry stark looking um, photos like that and the po more popular were one any of them that had green um, greenery and then there's one on the second <coughs> page I need to point this yeah, up see the dot. I wish I could no, show I the dot. point it towards you <laughs> <laughs> Looking for the red pointer or to advance? No, to, the slide. to advance. Watch it'll jump six pages. Ahead. It's <laughs> spinning. We looked at. Oh, uh, yeah, it is going to jump six pages. <laughs> um, so the uh, one of them it shows stone material for the walkway and has kind of water integrated into it. That one was really popular too. Um, but th this these are these images are part of the survey online. So I do encourage you please go on and take that. Since we're frozen, um, I'm actually, I have a handout of these, so I will pass that around. Hopefully we have some for the audience as well. moment if you want to walk them through it. One. Unfortunately, the folks watching might not be able to see, but we can we can use this to keep talking. Um, so we were just looking at the area one. Um, if you flip to area two, uh, this section is in the um, what we're calling South Riverfront area. It's really uh, from where Third Street goes uh, all the way to the PGE Dam. So. 
It includes um, Mill O, the Woolen Mill Foundation, um, kind of the, uh, the a couple tail race areas. Um, and uh, what we're asking about for this area is the pipe chase structure. It's that, um, uh, that square concrete structure that you see. Um, Mill O is that existing building that you see there. And then the, the yard is really the gathering area where you see all these little tiny people in the rendering. And so we're asking about, um, for the public yard, we had the precedent images, which if we get the uh, PowerPoint back up, we can see those. Um, and then the pipe chase, we have these uh, five options here. The first one is the porch. Um, we're taking the pipe chase and letting people walk on top of it, but then also um, creating some kind of steps inside to sit on and open up the front of it so you can have views of the river. Uh, great. Thank you, Laura. Okay, so here's that um, area two. And so you can see the pipe chase, this really long kind of tunnel-like structure, um, and then the yard. Oh, I don't think this is gonna work, so you might have to. Yard. Yeah, go for it. Can you move me forward? Um, <laughs> Can you move me forward two more? Okay, so there's the porch we, uh, the porch that we just talked about. Then the option two is the um, a bridge. So we're removing the um, under part of the or of the pipe chase, only keeping the top of it as kind of a bridge, um, and that helps to kind of connect that habitat that's behind it. Go ahead, Laura. The third option is uh, kind of doing a hybrid of those two. So you have the um, area with the top deck and um, a lower portion uh, with a hole cut out. What we actually have been talking about is uh, fish will, you know, the migra migrating fish in the river uh, won't go underneath something that's creating shadows. They won't go where it's dark. But if you cut a hole and allow light to pass through, then the fish will actually go in there. And so that's um, one of the reasons you see that in this option here. Uh, and then also if you're, if you're in the yard and you think about, you know, what are your views from that public yard space? If some of the clarifier, or clarifier, some of the pipe chase is removed, um, then that might open up some views out to, um, out to the river. And if you're keeping the whole thing as in option one, uh, with the porch that might block views. So we're thinking about that as well. Um, go ahead, Laura, the next one. Uh, this one um, kind of separates pieces of the pipe chase um, and creates a, kind of almost a destination within the area that you have to kind of find your way to by using the Explorer trails. Go ahead. And then um, almost completely removing the pipe chase to connect that habitat and create a big open area. Um, with maybe just a section of it retained. So we gathered um, input on all of these options at the, uh, at the workshop and we'll share those results with you, but we also wanna hear your reactions today. So once we're done, we can go back, once we're done with the presentation, we can kind of go back and discuss these. Uh, public yard um, gathering space, we've got precedent images and really we're looking at, um, you know, kind of flexibility here, do we want permanent fixtures uh, in here, like the play area or the public art, or do we want something that's uh, more open and simple and flexible? Um, what kind of materiality do we want hardscape or landscape? Um, and then, you know, what sorts of activities and, and um, events uh, do we want to have in this sort of space? And area three is a PGE dam in Mill E includes a clarifier and the falls overlook. Uh, so for the clarifier, which is actually um, quite large, it, it is the tank that treated the effluent from the paper making process. So pipes would bring all that water in there and it would go through a treatment process. Um, but after bankruptcy, the pipes were cut and that tank, um, the lid was removed and it was kind of drained. So now it's just this big concrete bowl. Uh, and it's quite an interesting structure. Um, it's unique, but also uh, the basalt uh, cliff that it's kind of sitting perched on top of 
has very unique uh, species of plants and provides a lot of unique habitat. And so, you know, we're kind of weighing the options on retaining it or removing it. So we have some different options. Go ahead, Laura. Oh, first we can show you some pictures of, of the clarifier. Uh, this is from the um, Falls Overlook, the Holly Powerhouse Foundation looking uh, north. Um, the clarifier doesn't actually look very large, but you can see the PGE dam um, and you can see the, the basalt um, outcroppings with the, the rare plant species. Go ahead. And this is just a view from the other direction. And so I believe this one is just the base drawing, so we can move on to the first one. Um, so we're looking at the, cl the clarifier on the left, and then the cutout kind of, you know, you don't see the whole PGE dam, it kind of disappears and then comes back to that falls overlook, um, just to try and orient you to what you're looking at. Um, but the clarifier, this, this option would remove it and restore habitat. Uh, we have an option of turning it into an event space, a theater in the round, um, creating a tiered seating. Another option that um, allows for uh, kind of non-permanent activities, um, seasonal activities. Uh, this one is, um, you know, hot air balloon rides where you can kind of get up high and, and get views. And it's not necessarily suggesting that that would happen, but it's suggesting that we would provide a a platform for non-permanent things like that to happen. Uh, this option shows a pathway around the perimeter of the clarifier with an option to connect that path um, out to the powerhouse foundation, the overlook. So it creates a secondary pathway out to, out to the viewpoint. Um, and that's really if, if the PGE has to sh close the dam, close the walkway, for maintenance, for operations, then we have that secondary path. Um, it might also help with circulation if you're thinking about, you know, lots of people visiting and viewing and having different ways to get out there um, could could be an advantage. Um, the inside of the clarifier in this in that option is turned into a planter. Uh, and then the last option is kind of the similar perimeter walkway uh, with. Uh, even more dirt added in uh, to create a little hill. Um, and maybe you could get up on that hill and get a better view of the falls. And it might be the only place on site where you could actually have soil, potentially. Um, and then for the falls overlook, we have precedent images. Um, where we're looking for reactions to um, the look and feel and the experience. Um, do we want to provide covered um, space? Uh, from the covered from the weather, do we want to provide places to sit and relax? Um, you know, what kind of materials do we want to use? So we're looking at. Um, thanks, Laura. Uh, project calendar. Uh, we've got, as I said earlier, preferred design coming in March. Um, it says winter seventeen up there, so late winter uh, seventeen. And uh, because we have um, <coughs> almost 20 million of the 60 million that we're estimating that the full river walk uh, will, um, will take, uh, we will be able to move forward on a phase one. Uh, so after we have a preferred design, uh, we'll also figure out in March of that full concept, what can we build, what can we afford, what makes sense to build first, uh, what can be paired with private development potentially, and then we'll use that um, budget that we currently have to start working on the construction documents and the permitting and construction, and we expect to be, be able to start that in um, mid-2018. So with that, uh, we can go back and discuss any of the options that you want to discuss, or I can answer other questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let it die, Jess. Yeah. Jesse. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Kelly. Um, the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association had a meeting last week, and we talked about the event from November 17th. And um, there was one question that I was asked to bring up um, today on this, which is in Area 2, the yard, um, apparently the oldest building on site 
was built in 1903. That's the Pullery slash Carpentry Shop. Mm -hmm. it is located kind of, okay. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know where it is. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't presented in any of the design options, but apparently has conceptually been considered for being moved or incorporated somewhere else. Could you talk about that at all? Sure. Um, it's a carpentry shop. Yeah, the design team, um, well, for one, we know that uh, the upper section of it is in really bad condition, uh, but not all of it. And there's some really great old wood um, that, that isn't in such bad shape that could be reused. And so one of the ideas that the design team had was to kind of take what's left, what's good, still in the building and move it or kind of rebuild it um, somewhere else within that public yard space, um, maybe more centrally located uh, potentially and kind of use it as some sort of um, covered shelter area um, within the public space. So yeah, we're, we're definitely, that's still on the table and, and it's, um, it wasn't uh, because it's, it's, you know, the, the public yard, we just were looking at those precedent images and, you know, we didn't necessarily have a lot of different, you know, there aren't really a lot of different design options. It's just kind of space where you could put structures and you could put, um, you could have events. And so uh, we are, um, we didn't have a lot of details to, to bring um, about. So sorry, to, to clarify, that would be using some of the wood in a different structure or rebuilding that entire structure somewhere else I think either of those things are on the table it, it's a highly conceptual idea um, but knowing the um, significance you know and the the age of the building and kind of the um, condition of the wood um, you know that it's a material that a lot of uh, people would like to see reused I think that's definitely a strong consideration Thank you. Joyce so knowing that this is a public-private partnership and um, you know, that some of the land the property owner has donated for a river walk, but is this whole area here, this public yard, has that been given to the river walk by the property owner or is, or is that still in negotiation? Yeah, we have a preliminary easement on the property um, and so the final negotiation will be, you know, kind of a final easement based on the river walk design. Um, so the way the easement's written now, it's kind of, it's not, it's not really well defined. Um, but the framework plan actually shows that whole yard area as uh, open space and not development. So it almost kind of implied, you know, that it would be part of the river walk or part of the public um, open space. Okay. Just to clarify, that was the it's kind of still. Uh. So, <laughs> oh, so there was a plan that happened at, back in 2011. We went through this public process when we did the zone change from industrial to this zoning designation, which was new and created, and it put some general parameters on the site. And so there was that map um, early yeah. on. I yeah, it's up. like the second page of the presentation. Yeah, um, but yeah, so that was a. Uh, adopted by the Planning Commission and City Commission along with the zone change so it's um, it is the guiding land use plan that um, dictates okay, it just what happens looked like a the site. you know big chunk of property and I'm thinking wow mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. we're talking about oh that yeah. turns it into much more than a walkway as you said yeah. it does and, and it's also important to consider the flood line um, which kind of cuts all the way back here towards a woolen mill um, so all of this space here is is within the 1996 flood um, overlay Kelly, what's the difference between the porch and the portal <laughs> Is that on page so two? one of them, option three says remove, and it's got a, a, oh, a little, little structure little. called a portal, and I'm oh. trying to figure out. It's like a, cutting the porch in half. Is mm -hmm. that just like a viewing spot, or the yeah. porch shows some like, like, you know, large crowds are gonna mm. look out and peer across the river, like Westlands. 
and I have a stage over there waiting for us or something. Looking at the falls and the river. Um, no, it doesn't look at the oh, But it doesn't look at the falls, right? It looks, I mean. I think you can view the falls from the, um, on top of the pipe chase. You can see the falls from there. On top, but the, the, the little, I'm, I'm. Oh, below. Below. Um, in the portal box, in the, in the, in the box lean, seating. You have to lean out and look that direction. Are you talking about? Yes, you're that, watching. Is that fish, just a viewing? Yes, uh, it's not suggested to be any sort of other type of building. Is there an option where just all all that pipe chase goes? Oh, that's the closest one to get it all removed. And I was just wondering what you know if the portal really is providing you know that much in terms of value compared to just opening it all the way up at the bridge I think the, I think the hard part of that is it holds up part of the millow oh it does okay. yeah on the oh, back, so they the have to keep that section that. okay um, so there is some benefit there uh, when you look at how millow is constructed and I'm pretty sure it's tied in tied in there okay yeah yeah, yeah. cool Jesse again? Wait, anybody first? No? Okay, seconds. <laughs> Thank you. Laura, could you go back to that overhead bird's eye view? Perfect. So the neighborhood, and this is not me, but the neighborhood is enthusiastic about the water that's shown in this slide, um, both on the left and the right, both those tail races. So a couple of things, though. You mentioned earlier that a couple of the options for the yard um, had shadows and that fish didn't like passing through those. I, my understanding was that ODFW didn't want fish going up in there. So is that changed? Did I misunderstand you? Uh, actually, so the science that we've um, kind of been using, you know, Metro scientists are working on it. We have still water sciences on the design team. Um, talk about uh, providing places for fish to rest out of the current as they migrate upriver and providing roughness along the shoreline. And uh, n the natural lay of the land is actually a lot more like that. If you look at the old historic photographs before all that was built, um, there was a big uh, part of the river kind of that, that went in between the basalt outcroppings. And so that actually brings um, back more of kind of the natural state of things. Um, and also, yes, you're right that uh, ODFW doesn't want uh, a lot of water flowing through and a lot of flow coming down into the river because that will attract the fish um, to try and swim up and think it's a fish ladder or a way to get up. Um, so we don't want a lot of water flowing, but we can have uh, places for fish to kind of go in and rest. Okay. Thank you. And part two of that is what kind of water rights can you talk about for getting the water <coughs> to flow through to the extent it could flow through? Uh, we're looking at into water rights. Um, we also have the option of, um, <clears throat> sorry, sending uh, m maybe storm water um, after it's treated, kind of put, uh, having that flow into uh, the tail races. Um, we're working with, uh, with those permitting agencies on kind of what really is uh, you know, we've we've been told we've heard a trickle, like you, a trickle is fine. Um, so what does that what does that mean? Is kind of what we're looking at, but we know it can't be a whole lot of water, you know, gushing through there through a tail race. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Mm. All right. Thank you. I think we're. Thank you. Uh, and I do encourage excited. to take the survey. Uh, it does. The first round closes. We're we're going to take a first round of survey results. Um, in two days. So if you take it before December 7th, you'll be in the first round. After that, it will still be open and we'll take more results later. So thank you, Amy. Perfect. Is she ready? So next up we have, it's Amy Chase Herman, is that right? Yes. Okay. Hi, Amy. Hello, Amy. <laughs> From Clackamas County Resolution Services. Yes. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're going to tell us all about how to fix it, right? 
Oh gosh, well just give me a problem and we'll have a conversation. Perfect. <laughs> we'll figure it out. So um, I am with uh, Resolution Services and we're within the Clackamas County, um, uh, we're in a department in Clackamas County. Resolution Services is a combination of um, services that range from domestic relations mediation to community neighbor to neighbor mediation and a lot of things in between. Um, the services include things like um, small claims mediation, which we get um, funneled to us with referrals through the court system. Um, we do the neighbor to neighbor mediation, um, actually providing free services to neighbors in dispute under a grant that we get through the U of O Law School. Um, they have a, de a department there called the Oregon Office for Community Dispute Resolution Centers. There are actually 17, I think 16 now, um, community mediation centers around the state of Oregon. And some of them are housed in government agencies and um, cities or counties and others are nonprofit. So I belong to an association that does that kind of work around the state of Oregon. Uh, we also provide services for foreclosure avoidance facilitation. There's a state program that helps people who may be losing their homes to apply for um, uh, the ability to sit down with the banks that they're having trouble with and trying to find a, a way out, um, a way to keep their home or a way, a graceful way out. So we provide those services as well. And um, facilitation services, workplace mediation services, so that's kind of the scope of what we do, and I'm assuming because you all are involved in um, neighborhood associations that you might have a variety of different interests in, in either using mediation or facilitation. Okay. Sometimes there are situations where neighbors are having a dispute with one another. Um, sometimes you've got homeowners associations who have issues that they're trying to find solutions for. Um, sometimes there are issues that you have even between neighborhood associations or with the city for different development issues that may be coming up. So there's lots of different <coughs> levels of service that we can provide even within that, that focus of, of work. So um, I can dive into any, um, any particular service and um, I'm wondering if there's something specific that you're all interested in. Is there a fee, like if a neighborhood association wants to use your services is there a fee for that with uh, so I can give you kind of a, um, a choice of things if it's a neighbor to neighbor issue we can do uh, we can provide free services to those neighbors under a grant that we that we get from the um, Oregon office from community of community dispute resolution if it's if it's a neighborhood association that has a larger issue maybe it's within their own ranks and they are having trouble with a board situation um, then we're offering the services for a fee, and our, our flat fee is $100 an hour for services. And I think typically what you'd see is um, we would spend an, you know, half an hour to an hour with an individual who is involved in a dispute um, prior to getting a group of people together. So depending on who the stakeholders are and who would be involved in the, in the joint session, We'd spend some time up front talking to people, determining what the issues were, um, and then bringing people together. And it's a voluntary process, so people aren't forced to come to mediation. But if you want to come to mediation part participate, then we would provide a, a mediator to help work people through a process of um, listening to one another deeply to really understand what the issues are, get people to um, hold their minds open even if they've got a perspective or a position and then sort through all the options that might be available to that group of people for problem solving then the mediator is going to help um, write up any agreements that you might come to and memorialize those and typically um, the neighbor to neighbor agreements are goodwill agreements so they're going to be you know you're going to enforce them yourselves you're hopefully going to be self-enforcing by saying okay this is working this is lovely we, or what did we say we agreed to two months ago? Let's go back and revisit that. Or if it's not working, then you can come back and say, let's, we need to have a, a conversation to further this agreement along. So we can help in those ways as well. Does yeah. anybody have questions specific or specifics? Questions? Yep, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a surprise. Everybody was waiting uh, for you. <laughs> uh, I'd be curious, do you, uh, do you come to neighborhoods and do you uh, lay out the uh, the the multiple options um, 
I mean, can you be invited? Is, is yes, that a fee? Absolutely. Or? Yeah, we um, we're available to come speak at neighborhood association. So if you have a meeting, you can give us a call and just let us know that you'd like us to come speak. There's no charge for that. And then mm -hmm. people are aware of our services. Our best um, advertising is word of mouth. So when people are able to use the services and, and benefit from those, then they're more likely to tell everybody else about them. And then we have people calling our office for, for help. So that's what we like. We also engage volunteers who we train. And we've got a basic mediation training coming up in March. We typically do it twice a year where we uh, train citizens. We do charge a fee for that, but there's a scholarship available half price. So if somebody were going to um, volunteer to be a, a mediator at our program, then um, we would train them to do the work that, that we do with, with neighbors. Um, so there, there is that. And then if there was somebody who had a specific issue that they were interested in talking to us about, we could coach them. We could help them decide whether or not they wanted us to contact their neighbor or whether they wanted to try and do that directly themselves. So we, there's, there's a lot of different ways people can approach conflict resolution, and it really depends on the situation that they're looking at. Good. Yeah. Good. And your information is on the uh, paper? Uh, yes. I'm um, looking at your name Yes, here. the contact yes. information. And this is, is the number? I, I also brought my business cards, so I'll grab those and make sure that each one of you has one of those. Appreciate it. It's a lot easier to get some, a hold of someone if you've got their direct number. <laughs> <laughs> and we do have a website. It's listed on there as well, I think. Um, I'm hoping it is. And uh, if, you just see, if you just go to Clackamas County Resolution Services and Google that, then you can get to our website, and it lists all our different kinds of, of um, services. But if you... Um, if you have a need for even uh, a short training, we can do something that would be appropriate for your particular group and help people think about how to talk to one another constructively. Um, people don't, you know, conflict is part of life. We run into situations where we don't agree with one another, but there are different ways that we can handle those conversations so that they don't rupture what's going on in the community. Um, and if we can help people work through those issues um, respectfully together, then your community is a lot more comfortable place to be. And we all know what it's like when something doesn't work well and we're not comfortable driving into our own driveway because we know somebody down the street is, uh, we're not happy with them. So we want to try and help people get past those situations so that they can feel um, you just, you know, respectful of one another and that they have some sort of an agreement around the situation that they're disputing. <coughs> Thank you. Anything else? Other questions? All right. We really appreciate this. We have right. well, several we needs that we now we <laughs> now we have a face. Now we have a little bit of an information. Yeah. There you go. And we've got we've got uh, different people who can come out and provide those speaking services. I'm one of them. Um, there are other people that can do that as well. But as when it comes to actually providing mediation. We have um, quite a group of volunteers and staff that can respond to those requests. So, so like what you were just talking about of coming out and having a little meeting to teach people, that would be under the $100? No, that, that actually coming out and speaking to groups is something that we do as part of our grant. Oh. So that's considered an outreach piece that we would do. Um, if, if a neighbor to neighbor situation, if two neighbors had a dispute, that would not be something that would be uh, paid for, that they would be charged for, excuse me. The situations that we would charge a fee for are kind of the bigger processes where we'd have, we'd be spending a lot more staff time trying to do um, um, assessment work with a group and maybe um, if it was a, a larger process that was going to go on for quite a few hours, you know, days, weeks, months, then we'd be looking at needing to charge a fee to support that work. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the grant, we're able to support um, a mediation which would take anywhere from, say, you know, four to eight hours. Let's let's kind of look at it that way. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Okay. okay. That's really good. Great. Good. Well, we hope to hear from you, and we really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. Thank and, you. And just uh, let everybody know. <laughs> Not often you hear someone say, contact, we'd love to hear about your conflict. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's we what, all say, oh. Yeah, that's what keeps us as a business. <laughs> all right. Yep. Thank all right. you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Okay, John. I can follow the conflict, huh? The happy conflict. The happy that's conflict. Yeah, so that's <laughs> generally appropriate, yeah. Would you like her to hang around for a little while? A little while, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Help me out here just a bit. Um, 
So a couple staffing updates. So we are still in um, heavy pursuit of a development engineer. We've struggled to fill that position, but we've got so much development activity. And it's true for the uh, engineering community at, at large. I mean, it's really tough to find folks uh, right now that are uh, willing to take on the arduous task of reviewing development and working with the development community. So uh, we'll keep we're, we're continuing to make progress on that. We also have a water quality technician who does most of our drinking water uh, and stormwater testing and analysis that will be, uh, we're, um, we've got a, a gentleman in that um, position now who's retiring. So we're trying to fill that uh, position as well. So both of these are positions that are um, hopefully gonna be filled in the next couple of months. The uh, elevator which you've all ridden on before um, has got a person in it that um, operates the elevator and there's also a small uh, group of folks that schedule staff so there's a, a small army I guess you could say that keep that elevator running and the city pays for that service those aren't city employees they're uh, contract employees and for about 25 years now they've been uh, operating the elevator through contracts that have uh, we've solicited for proposals over the last several years to try and get others to uh, consider doing that job for us and for the most part it's been one company that's done a great job by the name of Five Star International or yeah Five Star International and uh, you, you just you get to know the people that are in in the car if you travel the elevator much but you don't necessarily um, know the behind the scenes but they're uh, a small company and between them and some of the key folks Sandy for instance you might remember Sandy from uh, years of service there uh, have decided they're ready to retire and they're not um, they have t notified the city that they're they'd like to move on and try other things so um, it's timely in that we have to we've been using them under a contract for the last four years and so it's time for us to renew that and go through a selection process. So we opened that up, and w when we learned that they weren't interested in um, running the elevator uh, any longer, we reached out to uh, Main Street, so Jonathan Stone, and talked to him a little bit about maybe how Main Street could help fulfill that need. Um, there are other staffing companies that could pursue that as well, but we went ahead and advertised it like we would any other RFP. and. Um, Main Street was the one company that um, submitted, and they submitted a r very responsive proposal. They've got um, some good ideas on how to continue the operation and uh, some new ideas about how that might uh, uh, better, uh, how those operators might better inform the public that's using <laughs> the elevator. And um, so I think they've got some ideas about more more of uniform, standard uniform, so it looks a little more official, those kind of things. So um, so anyway, they, they, they should be taking over around February 1st. The commission needs to make a decision on that Wednesday. So uh, just look for that change. Hopefully it won't affect your elevator ride one bit. Um, they might tell us some more about it. They might. They might have more information and, and uh, take a stronger interest in informing the riding public of interesting things so I think that's the model that Jonathan's going for maybe not the seven o'clock crowd going right to work don't want to be talked to <laughs> they haven't had their coffee yet. I don't know do you ride with that group I, no. I haven't been with them so <laughs> no I'm the most I think they group. might be friendly too um, let's see capital projects we just had a 15 Street waterline kind of debrief meeting with the contractor and the consultant and they uh, did, that's one contract that's gone really pretty well it's taken a long time, but it's been a, about 4,000 feet of water line with all the cross street connections that go along with it and all the service lines. So um, it's essentially done. We did add some additional sewer work down near 15th and Main, and um, we've got a utility conflict right now. So they built the sewer line long ago, and then a, a com communications provider built a duck bank that sits right over our sewer line. So we're working with them to um, get that moved so we can replace the sewer line because it's in pretty bad shape. Um, but all in all, that project went pretty well, and um, all of that was in the McLaughlin neighborhood, so 
Um, that's one of the areas where, if you remember from our waterline deficiency um, conversations that we had a few years ago, McLaughlin neighborhood's got a lot of old pipes, and um, <clears throat> so we've got we got to replace a few of those. Um, the Lynn Avenue sewer moratorium project, uh, as of today, all the pipe work is complete. Now we ask the contractor um, after they complete a project like that to test the sewer lines to make sure they're not leaking. So that's yet to happen. So hopefully there's, we're keeping our fingers crossed that there's no leaks because if there are, they might have to dig them up and fix them. But right now we're hoping for uh, no leaks so that we don't have to dig that road up anymore and close that road anymore. Because I know that's been a long haul. So um, anyway, that, moving forward, that's the, you know, if you remember the moratorium, there was seven project areas. So that's the sixth project area, and the last one is um, up in the Hazelwood neighborhood. So that's also going to be a very difficult project, but not as impactful. It's not in a busy street like uh, like Lynn Avenue. So um, another project that's coming that we just want to make sure you're aware of. This one is a um, basically a vertical pipeline. I've talked about it before. It's along 9090. It's that bluff at Third Street. If Third Street were to come off the McLaughlin neighborhood and you know you, it just drops straight down right there there's a water line right there right near the flag on the promenade so if you walk along there you, you can see the top of that and um, so we've we've hired a design firm that what's it's, the design is expected to be finished in December we um, because the work will have to to accomplish the replacement of that pipeline will be will have a pretty big presence in uh, 99e so we've talked to ODOT about it, and ODOT's been considering the same kind of project because in 2018 they're planning on doing um, a lot more rock scaling and maybe redoing a lot of the um, rock fall protection that's hanging off the bluff there. So um, we're talking to them about our project, and they're watching our project pretty well. They asked us to put together a public notice program, which will reach out to communities beyond Oregon City. Obviously, there's a lot of use of 99E that's not just Oregon City citizens, so we're putting that together right now, and um, we hope to uh, get the project out to bid um, and have that awarded sometime in the middle of February, and we think we'll have um, 10 to 15 days of lane closure along 99e and that's why it's important to notice everybody because uh, well i know how much you love traffic delays but this one's mm -hmm. going to be another big one um really just because of the complexity of the work the potential for rock fall in order for us to put the new pipeline we've got some pretty deep anchors that we need to drill into the basalt rock and um, there's concern that well what if something falls off that bluff while you're doing it so it'll be uh, really two lanes that will be open and two lanes that will be closed and so that will neck uh, traffic <laughs> down in order to really do that safely we'll be um, uh, limiting lanes from s South 2nd up near the top all the way down to Main Street down near the bottom and so that's just because of the tunnel and the truck turning movements it all kind of works together and ODOT's pretty specific about what their expectations are there so um, it'll be closed the full time and we'll probably have work hours that'll extend into the evening just to get as much work done in as short amount of time as we can. So that's a big project. Um, uh, Moal Avenue grant project, it's still moving in a positive direction for Oregon City, so I won't say too much about it because I've talked about it before. And um, let's see, I did have a, I'm going to go through this pretty quick. I know it's getting kind of late, so just go through the alternative uh, there's two projects in this presentation and really this is for the city commission meeting so I just carried over the same uh, presentation for you folks um, so we've talked about um, this intersection that you're very familiar with it's Beaver Creek and Highway 213 and um, because of the potential for development out there and the congestion that exists today um, the state of Oregon is interested in seeing us do a pretty thorough study about um, what kind of improvements could happen here and uh, are practical and reasonably affordable and um, would improve both
congestion, safety, and alternate modes of travel um, in the area so that preferably there'd be a r less number of vehicles, maybe not from what there is today, but at full build out, right? We're looking longer term than just today. So th this is the, uh, does everybody know where that is? Okay. Um, so during our transportation system plan, which wasn't, isn't that old, that intersection um, ha was determined to have or will have, um, will, won't meet the current standard for movement of traffic. And um, there's enough growth there that the rec there was recognition that it's, it would get real congested during certain hours of the day. So um, uh, TSP, at the time of the TSP, uh, when we updated the TSP, there was another project, which some of you might remember, which was a grade-separated interchange, which um, was at, at the original TSP, uh, it was over 20 million. Um, by the time we got to the 2009 TSP, there was recognition that it was gonna be much more than 20 million. So probably more like 40 million. And ODOT was clear with us at the time that there was no way um, that interchange was gonna see funding uh, and they, they weren't going to make that a priority. So um, they made a, but they did make a requirement that the city study that intersection, look for other means for one, reducing trips, improving better um, opportunities for bikes and pedestrians and making it safer. And really at the end of the day, it's probably more about um, acknowledging that, the, the, that that intersection is just going to be a little more congested for probably during peak hours, a longer period of time than it is today. So we're kicking off the effort. We're working with uh, Laura and her group to um, put together a couple advisory groups. And um, one of them is the community advisory group. So the technical advisory group is mostly um, staff and technical folks from ODOT, Clackamas County, and Oregon City. The community advisory group is, um, will be informed by s uh, some of that work that the technical group's doing, but it's more about um, members from this committee, for instance. So Mike uh, Mitchell is serving on this uh, technical advisory committee and uh, uh, somebody from our TAC, somebody from the city commission, Brian, I don't know if you've been elected for that, but we need, it. We need somebody <coughs> to sit down on that. I'm, I'm sure you got nothing else to do, so you might. <laughs> it pays a bunch, I'm telling you. <laughs> kind of like the job you've already got. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, a race. Sour, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, the, 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 I've, I've kind of talked about some of the things, but looking for feasible and practical you know, improvements that can be done at the intersection. And um, again, I've, I've talked through this slide. And um, really, we're looking for advice from both the technical group and the community advisory group. And um, just kind of, I mean, really, a lot of this is about keeping folks informed. So we'll be, have, there'll be lots of um, staff. And this is mostly uh, city staff. Um, we use John Replinger and Associates for most of our traffic consulting. And then ODOT, Clackamas County, Metro, and um, TriMet. Um, the project schedule and Mike hopefully you've you've got hopefully somebody gave you some indication of what you were committing to um, but anyway we're <coughs> expecting meetings between now and April and um, we'd like to finish things up really in terms of a final report that we can start actually circulating to the Planning Commission and the City Commission in May. John isn't uh, what, how much is Beaver Creek Road is county isn't that still county in there or? So Oregon City has uh, jurisdiction over Beaver Creek Road on this side of 213, uh -huh. and on the other side, or the high school side, is Clackamas County. So they're a key stakeholder. In yeah, okay. So, um, again, somebody to like Mike who's willing to learn, able to learn, I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Should we have learned this before we had uh, Yeah, maybe we would have thought of somebody else. Huh? Um, Let's try to chase you away. Yeah, the conflict management might help with them. Um, again, just we're expecting quite a few meetings. And anyway, this is the this is the other makeup. And again, 
just showing you some of the players that will be on here, somebody from the Planning Commission, TAC, City Commission, CIC, and all the other kind of groups. We're trying to reach out to as many as we can um, just to kind of get a good cross-section of the community to sit in on that. So with that, any questions? If on not, this or on anything? Uh, I got one more to go through. If, Why don't you do that? Okay. Unless somebody has a question. Dennis. The, um, the 99E, uh, 15 days approximately? Is that what you're, I want to pass it along. 10 to 15 neighbor. days. Okay, thank you. You'll get a lot more notice on that too. So just, just another one that um, we were going to give the commission an update on, so I thought I'd include it. Berry Hill Apartments retaining wall. We've seen some of these pictures, but they did some they did some drone photos, which are kind of cool to look at. So this is looking uh, down at the apartments. That's the aplex, the big building, and then the duplex. This is um, really the slope between the upper uh, part of the slope, which is Berry Hill, and then uh, kind of at the bottom of the screen is moving down towards the Forest Edge Apartments. And all that white there is just plastic that's covering up the slope, and there's a large piece of equipment, that red, those two red uh, pieces of equipment there are um, installing some pretty long steel uh, columns, if you will. So owner, contractor, geotechnical engineer, structural engineer, there's a lot of folks on the property owner side that are pretty um, involved in this project. And we're, it's really not a city project. I guess I want to make that really clear as well, because I've forgotten to mention that. This isn't a city project, but it's an interesting project. We're approving it. We've got um, Tim Pfeiffer, who we use for a lot of our landslide and, and geotechnical analysis for any development projects we use and so he's he's involved on our side but it's more from a review perspective and really the property owner and this geotechnical engineer and structural engineer are the ones who are taking on uh, I guess the contractor too at this point are taking most of that liability on so again just more pictures um, showing they've done a pretty good job of keeping it covered in weather like what we had today I'm sure it's covered today They've been able to make progress even in the wet weather, but they don't necessarily work on wet weather days. They kind of uh, wait for things to dry out just a bit before they go back in there, but they're making progress. So in summary, a soldier pile wall, and I'll show you some of that. That wall is basically steel beams with, with timbers in between, and they tie those beams back. I think they're like 50 feet long, so they drive them pretty deep into the earth. And, and set them, actually they're drilling them in and they set them in concrete and then about midway up that beam they uh, drill a tie, uh, a tie anchor system back in, really it goes in under the eight plex building where that portion of the wall is. So that's it's kind of a neat, uh, a neat system. This is a, the picture on the, I guess it would be your left, is uh, kind of just a graphical section of that so those um, most of that wall uh, is below grade um, you will see some of the wall from the bottom side and it's ooh, I can't remember how many feet of wall it is um, I'm guessing it's about 300 feet of wall that they're building and my my recollect some of the numbers is at the end of the day between permitting engineering construction um, they spend about a million dollars on this wall so it's, it's a significant effort. We usually don't see this kind of thing in town. It's more <coughs> of you typically see it on ODOT projects where they're building highway and trying to um, uh, contain a, hide w a highway or a slope above the highway. But uh, these are just some pictures. Those are, that's, uh, that's the guys kind of setting the timbers down in between the steel um, columns. They don't actually drive these columns. Lots of projects, you'll see them hammer these. In this case, they're drilling and augering out that hole and then setting the beam in place and then filling it with a concrete slurry mix. And um, that's how it's anchored in there. And they go, they, they place those columns well below the slide plane, which is, you know, 20 feet deep or so. So they're well below that. So they've got um, pretty high confidence that they're that they will stop the sliding on the uphill side of the <laughs> wall for sure. So 
So um, they'd like to complete this by the end of January, but I think that's all weather dependent. So we're not holding them to the schedule. Let's see if I can scoot through these pretty quick. Actually put drainage, this black um, carpet-like thing that looks like it's hanging off the picture to the right there, that's, a, that's actually a, a conduit, if you will, that um, collects the water along the wall and takes it down to the bottom of the wall. Okay, questions on that or anything else? And with that. That's pretty neat. Oh, I guess one other update, um, the, the operations center, the public works operations center, we're moving in the direction of land use application um, for both the master plan update and the detailed development plan. And I know, uh, Jesse, we've been trying to reach out to um, uh, Denise, haven't, I don't, I haven't checked in with Martin, that was as of yesterday. Is she out of town by any chance? I don't think so. I'll check in tomorrow. Okay. So um, we just want to give McLaughlin a little bit of an update before we kind of hit the public uh, meeting uh, schedule. But uh, we've seen some new, um, kind of new drawings from our consultant that are give us a good place to start with what kind of the building looks like. We definitely got some good floor plans for both the armory building and our new building and definitely a lot of site plans where we've checked kind of turning radiuses and those kind of things to make sure our trucks are going to still fit in there. And uh, I guess the other thing I'll mention is because, especially since it's been in the paper um, a fair amount, the, the armory, so right now there's a, there's an article in the Oregonian about um, um, lead poisoning in, in um, armory buildings. And I guess that's due to the fact that a lot of them have been used for firing ranges over the years. So the Oregon City Library wasn't one of those that was listed, but we're going armory. through. Armory. What did I say? <laughs> library. library. Not the library. <laughs> Oregon City. We're taking armory. up the library now. <laughs> no, it, it hasn't been used as a shooting range. <laughs> uh, the armory. Um, so the, the state military department is right now doing a phase, what they call phase two environmental assessment. And... Um, we expect there's going to be some, whether it be mold or uh, lead or asbestos or something else. We expect something in that building, and it's really a matter of figuring out what the cost to remediate that's going to be. But we're making good progress there. So, so has the sale has that worked out? Well, that's all part of the sale. That's oh. that's part of the deal. That military departments told us, you know, they're not it's not their intent to walk away from that before they. Um, pursue a cleanup, but sometimes cleanup can out out cost the cost of the structure. But they still have to do cleanup, so yeah, we'll we'll keep working through that with them. So that's it for me. Any questions for John, Jesse? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned off offhand that in a few years ODOT might be redoing the ninety nine cliff, whatever I forget what you said. Scaling. Retention. Yeah. Uh, so they what do, would they be doing? In 2018, they're planning to um, really from the, well, a couple things happened by ODOT. There, there's also going to be provisions for um, electronic reader board. I don't know if you, as you go down about halfway down, there's just a sign that says slow, I think. It's just a static sign. And they have a project where they'll be um, doing a better job with illumination inside the tunnel as you go, so it'll be lit better. And then they wanted some, uh, as part of the Lamp Falls Legacy Project, they, um, they've been working with the city and the, their own resources to put together a, a plan for um, some s smarter signage that tells you slow down due to congestion, those kind of things. So that's one thing that they want to get done. And uh, the, the main thing is, yeah, looking at that sheer basalt bluff and do what they call scaling so they actually put climbers on the wall in either lift trucks or they just they just rappel down that and they start um, checking for soft spots or spots that maybe look like they're ready to fall and they've done quite a bit of that further um, south on on 99e where they uh, find soft spots that look like they might fall out and they just 
go ahead and try and knock them out of there to make sure everything's sitting solid. So they just they want to redo that. And I think uh, I haven't, we haven't seen their plans yet because they've just been talking about concepts. So um, right now there's that uh, mesh fencing that's kind of bolted to the wall. So they'd also <coughs> either redo that or find places of it, sections of it that need to be repaired. Wouldn't that hold any rocks from falling down? I mean, it's that chain link is pretty much everywhere, right? Uh, well, the chain link that is really um, not necessarily there to hold the rocks from falling out. It's more to keep the rocks contained and close to the bluff so they don't just fall out and land on the on the traveling public, if you will. So, yeah, it's it's not necessarily intended to to prevent them to f from falling out. Um, Sometimes they drill rock anchors where they drill right through it and they, they drill back deep, deep into it. I think they've done some of that above the Kanema Bluffs where you know they've got big rocks and they just want to further anchor them. They've done that. I don't know exactly the extent of what they have planned, but they'll be looking at that. And they're by far the expert on, on those kind of rockfall um, protection measures. Interesting. Thank you. Any other questions for John? All right, thank you. Do we have any public comments on items that are not on the agenda? Did anyone want to comment? Okay, so moving on to approval of the minutes. And um, for the minutes, we don't have a quorum. We need nine for a quorum for a majority because we have 17 So members. we'll take any changes that we can make and then we'll move that to the next meeting. But I know that I think there were a couple corrections that um, got noticed, Joyce. Correction on, under my name on the, at the end of the minutes um, that I introduced Vern Johnson and Georgia Regan. So the names were wrong. Georgia's last name is R-E-A-G-A-N. This is the November minutes because it looks like we're November. still waiting for yeah. August to also. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Georgia Regan. Did anybody else notice any corrections to the November? Okay. Oh. All right, so then moving on to. So uh, just a, a question, how many do we need for the quorum? Nine, there's 17 members and we need a majority. Because I thought, well, you need, how many? Voting. Voting Isn't members are half that many. Yeah. Uh, or, I mean. Right. Because only the actual, the primary members we only need to count, right? Yeah, so our code reads, a majority of the members constitutes a quorum for the meetings. Provided a quorum is present, voting members shall be approved by a simple majority of the voting members present. So you need to have a majority of the people. And then so you're counting alternates and primary as the, not, and then coming up with a majority and then well, only the voting people. Because we only get one vote per neighborhood. Well, we need people to vote. It's vo so shouldn't you just have 13 then? How many neighborhoods do we have now? That's a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> I have, a, I have, a, um, I have um, a, um, a, a sheet that you gave me called uh, Tally of Votes, and it's only the primary. So we have 12 neighborhood associations. One is inactive, the Hazel Grove Westling Farm, so that leaves 11. Well, Tower Vista doesn't have any CIC members. Not yet. Oh, no, not yet. Yeah, so 10. Yeah. Right. So we need how many out of that 10? Six. Six. Um, let me go back to that. I right? think we have six neighborhoods represented here tonight. Okay. Mike, some of us are doubled up, so. Mm. Yeah. You're right. I it's was just reading a majority of the members, <laughs> and then of that subset, right, a majority but I think it, of the voters. Okay. Yeah. So I think we have Sounds six good. here. We have One, seven. Two. Show Laura made a mistake. Okay. That doesn't happen very well. Seven. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do it then. All right, I'll, so who want? We need a motion to approve the August and the November minutes. So moved. Second. With the changes as proposed. With the changes, Correct. yes. Yeah, help us out, Laura. We need someone to second that motion. Second. Gary. All right. And so only one vote per neighborhood. One vote per neighborhood. Let's keep it right. Okay. But these we have agreed we can do by show of hand. So all in favor, please. Any opposed? As corrected. As corrected. All right. Motion passes. 
And actually, Robert's rules says that minutes don't have to be approved by vote. But hmm. there's it's something else that we found. Katie found it that said we should. So that's why we agreed to just At raise our hands. We do it. That's right. We're just gonna, we're trying. We're trying, right? Thank you. All right. Communications. Now can I go to that, Laura? Okay. I don't remember where she started last time. So let's just start over here with Mike. Uh, our next Caulfield meeting is on January 24th, Tuesday. Uh, we've moved our meetings to the new uh, Oregon City School District bus barn. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we don't have an agenda set yet, but we're reaching out to Wyatt Parno and Eric Underwood to try to get one or, one or both of them at our meeting. Nothing and else? And you'll make sure to well publicize that moving of the yes. meeting so you don't have a thing like Two Rivers had. Yep. Okay. Speaking of bus barn, and it's in your neighborhood, do you know how the artwork came about on that fence? Students. No, I don't. Students. Students at the, if you haven't driven past that fence, I would suggest you do it. That's that's really neat. I was really impressed. Okay, glad Beautiful to know. Cause that was had, my understanding, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good to know. It's a transportation facility, I put it out not a bus asked. barn. Oh, sorry. The transportation <laughs> facility. <laughs> That we left the bus barn behind. Right. Mike, how's the tra how's the traffic out there with the with the tr transportation facility traffic? I've I've not heard any more complaints than the usual. I'll cover that complaints. in my Gaffney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the other half of that. Because we yeah I haven't heard much either. Yeah. Which is good. Um, I live next to the old bus barn site, and strangely there. enough, it hasn't made any improvement there <laughs> of course I, I i'm typically not traveling at exactly the same time as the buses uh, and i think for the neighborhood association it's still the bigger issue is still the student traffic and not the bus traffic that's what they told us too that they were traveling at different hours than the peak hours right and right. sounds like they're sticking to it i'll make it a point at our meeting on the 24th to get more comment on that and feedback to the group. Okay, Dennis? Uh, next uh, neighborhood meeting is in February, uh, third week, uh, Thursday and the third week. Okay, Steve? My voice is a little suspect, so I'm gonna oh, yeah. let okay. Barbara handle it. Oh, perfect, Jesse? Thank you. We just had our steering committee meeting last week at McLaughlin, and we have a general meeting on Thursday the 5th at the firehouse. That's it. 5th of January. Yes. Okay. Thank you. A new year. Gary? Um, our next meeting will be in, in January. We'll make a report on the agenda when Bill gets back. January in our January meeting um, <coughs> which a long we time have. ago what? which we won't have because it's a holiday next meeting will be in February yeah. okay we'll make a report in February how the meeting went perfect <laughs> um, a long time ago we uh, we talked well not too long ago but we talked about the garbage on South End Road and I was going to build a um, some kind of a structure or a, so I did that and these these are all beer cans or or uh, liquid devices or you know drink and they were all collected in one day on the on the 5th of November when we did our last cleanup and all this all that's just cans we had like four or five bags of stuff but uh, if anybody wants to purchase this so we could raise money for uh, <laughs> <laughs> we could decorate it we were very nicely with some garland or whatever and it would turn out pretty nice anyway caution tape is the garland it could be, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could talk to the uh, Police tape. public, public works, works and get some <laughs> caution tape and a couple of cones around it. <laughs> anyway, we had a lot of fun. We had we had a pretty good little crew running up and down the road and took a couple hours, but we got her done. Okay. Gaffney Lane, we've had quite a few land use issues come up. Nothing like the Park Place land use. Ours are a lot smaller. But we had a sign code variance at the little 
I don't know what you call them, mini mall property, but the where little Cooperstown is. They came and mm -hmm. they want to sign code variance there. I have a subdivision on Lazy Creek and a new building going in on First Street. So we actually had a special meeting for the subdivision on Lazy Creek, and then the other two were able to come to our regular meeting in November. We have seen a lot more bus traffic on Myers Road. Um, that's not always good, those, you know, but, and I don't know of any accidents from that. I just know there's been a lot more bus traffic, which slows down that three-way stop at Gaffney Meyer, and Myers, because it backs up there. We have a group of neighbors on Caulfield. There's constantly been the compl uh, big problem for that neighborhood. We've worked with Martin and the TAC trying to see if we could get something done. Then we were told that ODOT really wasn't looking to make any more changes to that light, but the I was informed that, that the group, they're going to get together a petition and we need to get the contact information from ODOT because they would like to send a petition and letter from the neighborhood asking for a designated time to turn left off of Caulfield onto 213 because you can't get through the light. It's pretty dangerous. And especially with those new townhouses that were built and put in there on Caulfield. Um, and you know, it's a constant battle because Caulfield is a county road, but it's in the city limits and nobody's improving it. And so those residents are getting fired up more and more. Is, so. is that a petition that part of their process? I, I didn't know they were, or is well, that just something the neighborhood thinks? The neighborhood about? is hoping it'll help so that they feel that maybe it's been too informal the discussions between Martin and ODOT and and the, I don't I think Martin took it he's talked to the people at ODOT several times but the the neighbors think we're hoping that maybe if they put together something a little more formal that'll carry a little more weight than just a phone call from Oregon City to the state and you know I'm all about letting them try and see what we can do they did do a designated right turn um, lane from Glen Oak onto 213. So mm -hmm. it would be nice if they could do a time, because you can't safely get off Caulfield. It's pretty crazy. So that's what's happening. We, our actual next meeting won't be in January also. So that's what's going on in Gaffney. Um, let's see, uh, <coughs> Park Place neighborhood canceled their November 21st <coughs> steering <coughs> committee meeting because um, of the continuance that was requested by the developer and some of us were out of town or sick so we rescheduled the meeting for tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at uh, Academy Charter School on Front Street. And uh, we're expecting a, quite a group there. Uh, I attended the Riverwork presentation. It was excellent. And uh, the Barkley Hills Neighborhood Association in November. And that's about it. Anything else? Yeah. Joyce? Hill and Dale neighborhood. Um, I, too, attended the Riverwalk presentation. And please go online and... Um, Make your comments in the next couple of days for what they for what they want. Um, um, so Hill and Dale, we have a steering committee meeting tomorrow night. Wish I could go to Park Place, but I'm not sure where that meeting's going to take place. It's going to be seven o'clock at one of the restaurants in the Hill and Dale neighborhood. So if you want to know where it's going to be um, and you want to attend, uh, shoot me an email and uh, or. And Laura can give you that information if you don't already have it. But the emails that come out to all of us, my name's on that list. And our January meeting, I believe it's going to be January 3rd. It might be January 10th. Um, so we're still, tomorrow night we're supposed to be planning on who's going to be speaking at our January meeting. So things are going to be happening, but there's no big issues in Hillendale. Um, Although, just to let people know that the houses next to Wesley Lynn Park are still going to get built despite us losing on the election for them to um, build their road. It'll now just be a little driveway, and um, the city loses, but um, 
those houses will be going in. And uh, so Hillendale is, that's right on the borderline between Hillendale and Tower Vista. So Tower Vista is gonna be meeting with us and we'll be um, meeting with those, with the developer regarding those houses soon. I forgot to mention one thing. Um, so Amy brought back the um, garbage can. Drives, <laughs> drive safe Oregon City garbage can labels for I forget which neighborhood Tower Vista. Tower Vista. Um, she kept the ones for her neighborhood for now, but um, you know we've seen very few of those. I think Park Place has done s some of those. I've heard um, so we don't see many of them uh, in other places and places that I would have expected would have been, for instance, High Street or. Center Street in McLaughlin neighborhood. We still haven't seen those on the um, on the garbage cans, and the feedback that I've been getting is it's 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 more than what the neighborhood uh, committee people signed on for, and so I understand that we um, we I guess I'd rather get them back than a than have them kind of sitting in your in a desk or on a desk or in somebody's recycle bin. We'd like to get those back. They have some value. We will work with other groups. Um, some of the other suggestions that happened early on were Boy Scouts and maybe doing something with the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts. So um, we'll, we'll just don't worry about it. Don't, don't feel bad about it. If we could just get them back, that would be a good start. So if your neighborhood is still holding on to those and you're not really sure what to do with them, um, the Where best approach, you can bring them here. here? Yeah, just okay. put, put my name on them if you want to leave them at the front desk or call for me or something. We'll just collect those and figure out a new approach because that's still, I think, a, a good program and um, will be something we'll utilize. We, just, we handed every one of those out and uh, I didn't even have a, I didn't have enough version for myself. To, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm happy to get those back and we'll work on getting them out a different way. Amy, may I say one more thing? Gary reminded that, me. That's all, you said one. <laughs> oh. Sorry, go ahead, Mike. Okay. <laughs> with, with Gary and, the, and his wonderful Christmas tree reminded me. I'll put my Oregon City Parks Foundation hat on for a second. Um, we have a program called Drop In for Parks. Uh, it's headed up by Dee Dee Dalsrud, uh, and what it is, we provide uh, containers for recyclable cans and bottles at either special events, and we also have kind of a regular circuit of 10 or 12 businesses uh, in town, in, including there's one of them right behind the door, right back over here at City Hall, um, and it's a specially marked bag, so cans and, and bottles that go in there go to the recycle place, and all of the money goes to the Oregon City Parks Foundation and then to our parks. So if you're going to be doing any kind of a cleanup effort in your neighborhood and don't want to deal with the recyclable cans or bottles, we will be happy to get you a bag and collect it back from you and uh, the money goes to our parks. So, Actually, we can give you a bag and you can just drop it off at the bottle, bottle right. recycling bottle and, you and you don't have to yourself. count them or anything. You don't have to count them. You don't have to. Our sticker is on them. We get the money. The okay. So I could bring all the yellow garbage bags over to your house and then you go sort through the stuff? Is that... <laughs> uh, <laughs> to get the recycled pre cans. Let's, let's this was a dirty way. job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Laura. All right. Um, so on Saturday, we had our Friends of Trees planting event for McLaughlin, Rivercrest, and Barclay Hills Neighborhood Association. So at this, the city was proud to work with Friends of Trees to plant almost 100 trees, or about 100 trees. And um, primarily, they're in the planter strip between the sidewalk and the street, or you know, just the landscape area adjacent to the street. And um, it was really great. Friends of Trees dug the holes, which is the hardest part about planting the trees, and then came out and showed us all how to plant the trees properly. The thing that we like about working with Friends of Trees is that it's not just planting the trees and leaving. It's really creating um, education about how to maintain your trees. They actually go back a year later and check up on the trees and send um, continuing education or information about the tree maintenance. They go back even later after that and prune the trees a little bit. So um, it's a good relationship and we hope to continue that into the future. Um, it was a really good turnout and um, 
Well, one thing that was really nice about working with Friends of Trees and the neighborhood associations was the neighborhood associations hosted the event. So it was at the Zion Lutheran Church, but after the planting, um, all the neighbors uh, did a potluck and made food and brought it to the church. And so when we were all done planting, we got to have a feast. And so it was really nice to have that neighborhood community connection um, and for us to get out there and meet our neighbors. So other good news is that we were awarded $100,000 um, from Metro to work on equitable housing. So equitable housing means housing for everybody, which is sort of like a big term, but affordable housing has been something that's been coming up, coming up lately, but it's housing for um, maybe people in wheelchairs or people who need to live near a transit line or different income levels or things like that. So we're excited to um, start to work on that. Within 2017, you'll see us poach you for people to sit on advisory committees. We really wanna take a community conversation about housing and how we wanna approach housing opportunities within the city. Um, and then from that, some educational material and a model accessory dwelling unit or mother-in-law unit. And so all the construction plans would be there and you could just pick them up and build one if you wanted to. Um, so there are a lot of different components to that um, project. So we look forward to working together as a community to really think about housing those opportunities for us. Um, more good news. Uh, Beaver Creek Road concept plan, as you know, started about 10 years ago. We created a plan and adopted it locally. It went to Land Use Board of Appeals, got remanded back for a map to change with Metro. That took a while. Um, we came back more recently to readopt the plan and sync it up with all of John's work that he's been doing with all of his other utility plans that have been updated since that time. So we adopted the readoption of the Beaver Creek Road concept plan recently and um, that was challenged in the Land Use Board of Appeals and that decision came out and um, we are good to go. So they supported uh, the city's um, approval of that. And other than that, I just wanted to state one more time that our meeting in January is canceled, so we'll see you in February. Tom? So since we're not meeting in January, the city commission will be having their retreat January 20th and 21st. It's a Friday and Saturday, so it'll be Friday evening. I think we start around 4 o'clock at the Museum of the Oregon Territory on the fourth floor there, 211 Tumwater. Um, so great, uh, you know, goal setting for the next uh, two-year biennium uh, we'll be working on with uh, the commission. Uh, we had the election, obviously. Um, uh, Mr. Frank O'Donnell uh, was elected over uh, Paul Espy for one of the three seats that was up. It was the only contested seat. Nancy Ide ran, un uh, uh, ran without any opponent, as well as uh, sitting commissioner Renata Mengelberg. Uh, so those were the three seats that are up, and will be taking their, their, uh, their positions and getting sworn in on uh, the first meeting in January. Um, many of you are aware we passed the 3% tax locally for marijuana. We lifted the prohibition of marijuana retail and manufacturers in Oregon City. The um, ability to build the road on Westerland Park was denied. The urban renewal district um, measure was successful, essentially requiring that all the tax income and financing, all the revenues generated, need to go to pay down the debt in the district. And then the bonding authority for the police facility uh, was rejected. Uh, so we'll be having discussions with the commission um, in January on, on, on those, mainly the, the police facilities as well as the urban renewal district. Uh, last Monday, the folks who brought the citizen initiative, uh, we were in court, uh, they were requesting a little over 18,000 in attorney's fees. Um, for that for that measure so I believe it was May of 15 I believe going back a ways <laughs> Jesse would know um, is that when it was a, was that when it started it in April so yeah of oh, 15 right yeah yeah so a citizen initiative uh, came in uh, we accepted the ballot title and so then they were able to start collecting signatures down in Albany a gentleman brought forward the exact same ballot measure and it was uh, rejected by the city uh, and they took it to they took it to court 
Uh, the court down in Albany found that it was an administrative measure that they were trying to change rather than a legislative through the citizen initiative process. You can only change a legislative matter, not an administrative one. So the court found that Albany was correct in not accepting the, um, the citizen initiative. We um, also took our initiative to court uh, under the same, trying to determine that it was not um, allowed to go before the citizens for a vote. The court found that we were not timely in uh, bringing that measure. We should have brought it within five days of when the initial citizen initiative was submitted. So fast forward, um, a request for attorney's fees to be paid. Um, essentially, the, the decision was, you know, did the city act um, and should all of the fees uh, be awarded? And uh, one of the arguments made was that it was legislative in nature. Well, we disagree with that. And so the judge uh, set a hearing date for February 13th uh, to make a determination as to whether the ballot title measure was administrative and legislative, uh, which will have an impact not only on the applicability of uh, the ballot measure, uh, but also potentially the, the awarding of attorney's fees. So more to come uh, on that one, although we'll continue to have discussions with the city commission on urban renewal, uh, as well as um, what to do as it relates to the, the police facility and uh, the bonding authority uh, that we requested. Well, <clears throat> I think we need to welcome back Amy first, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, quite a challenge without you, so, but Ms. Morey did hang in there, and she did a great job, so, anyway, uh, scared, and then, scared her away. I don't know where she at tonight, <laughs> <laughs> we, we agree, you know, like how the vice president and the president don't show up at the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. just in case, just in case, yeah. she's a designated survivor, right. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Mr. Lewis brought up the uh, that retaining wall that's going in up on the uh, uh, ridge up there and stuff. Uh, that kind of brings us to the point that it's uh, the, the one year anniversary of that slide mm -hmm. is approaching us because it was Christmas when this all happened and the uh, city had to respond to that and we had to relocate 48 families, I believe, over a week's period as much as we could. And we did uh, take some money out of our um, budget to assist these folks that didn't find housing, and we actually accommodated them down at the uh, River Shore Hotel. Uh, I think it got down to three families and stuff. So um, we got to see our, our city at work at that time and stuff. And uh, um, so anyway, one year ago, so that was quite a quite a project for us. We could just add real quick sure. on that one. So um, a lot of credit goes to uh, Public Works and the Finance Department on that. So if you may recall, we had a big rain event uh, yep. all throughout the state, <coughs> a lot of flooding. So eventually there was a, a, a disaster declared for the state, including Clackamas County. Uh, because of the job that Public Works and Finance did and police in, in documenting our costs, we were able to be reimbursed for about 80% of what we spent, which was wow. ended up, we received a check for about 90, or do I have my numbers backwards? I'm forgetting it. Well, there was. But we, we were, be, because of our accounting and the information we turned in, we, we were able to receive a significant amount of the money that we, that we spent in responding to that with not only staff time, but expenses themselves uh, were reimbursed because of the federal disaster, as well as the emergency that we declared locally. Um, and it went very smooth. Um, you know, sometimes you've got to go back and forth in terms of trying to document what you spent, how you spent it. Uh, we were able to get ahead of that coming right out of the gate, which made the reimbursement process uh, very smooth and quick, relatively speaking. So mm -hmm. that was good news there. Kudos. And so uh, lastly, I wanted to uh, recognize that we're, you know, there's actually you know, the homeless issue in our community here. Uh, some neighborhoods are being affected probably more than others, and uh, there actually is a, uh, a group of folks that are addressing that right now that includes the chief of police and, and faith-based groups and all kinds of folks that are, uh, are, are putting together uh, a program 
that hopefully we can address this. And uh, I think our our uh, position is that we want to accommodate these folks, but we don't want to encourage it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of a <laughs> there's a fine line there, and um, but we're actually making some headway with it. So um, I know folks in the McLaughlin area and Hillendale area, you're you're kind of getting the brunt of, uh, of this, but uh, um, it's a pretty complicated issue. And uh, so we're trying to breaking it all down and see how, what resources we have to, uh, to um, assist with this. So just to kind of let you know about that, so, okay. Okay, anybody else have a last minute thought? All right, we are adjourned until February. <coughs>